In this lecture, we'll learn about the life stages of a high-mass star, how high-mass stars make the elements necessary for life, and how these enormous stars die. The early life stages of high-mass stars are similar to the early stages of the sun's life, except they proceed much more rapidly. We'll see that it's the late stages that are quite different for high-mass stars. Hydrogen fusion in a high-mass star proceeds through a different set of steps compared to the low-mass stars. Low-mass stars fuse hydrogen into helium through the proton-proton chain. In a high-mass star, the strong gravity can compress the core to higher temperatures than in lower-mass stars. The hotter core temperature makes it possible for protons to slam into carbon, oxygen, or nitrogen nuclei, as well as into other protons. Although carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen make up less than 2% of the material from which stars form, this 2% is more than enough to be useful in the stellar core. The carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen act as catalysts for hydrogen fusion, making fusion proceed at a far higher rate than would be possible by the proton-proton chain alone. This faster chain of hydrogen fusion reactions is called the CNO cycle. CNO stands for carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. The overall reaction of the CNO cycle is the same as that of the proton-proton chain. Four hydrogen nuclei fuse into one helium-4 nucleus. The amount of energy generated in each reaction cycle is the same for both the proton-proton and CNO cycles, but the CNO cycle reactions happen much faster, leading to the enormous luminosities and short lifetimes of high-mass stars. The late-life stages of high-mass stars are similar to those of low-mass stars. As its core hydrogen runs out, a high-mass star responds much like a low-mass star, but much faster. It develops a hydrogen-fusing shell, and its outer layers begin to expand outward, ultimately turning it into a supergiant. At the same time, the core contracts, and this gravitational contraction releases energy that raises the core temperature until it becomes hot enough to fuse helium into carbon. However, there is no helium flash in stars of more than two solar masses. Degeneracy pressure is not a factor. A high-mass star fuses helium into carbon so rapidly that it's left with an inert carbon core after no more than a few hundred thousand years. Once again, the absence of fusion leaves the core without an energy source to fight off the crush of gravity. The inert carbon core shrinks, the crush of gravity intensifies, and the core pressure, temperature, and density all rise. Meanwhile, a helium-burning shell forms between the inner core and the hydrogen-burning shell. The outer layers swell further. All life stages proceed more rapidly in high-mass stars. However, degeneracy pressure prevents intermediate mass stars from reaching temperatures required to fuse carbon or oxygen. High mass stars can get hot enough to fuse heavier elements. Let's summarize things so far for high mass stars. We go from protostar to hot main sequence star fusing hydrogen into helium via the CNO cycle. When the hydrogen runs out, the star becomes a red supergiant. Eventually, it will be able to fuse helium in its core after the core runs out of helium, it will shrink and heat up. A high-mass star can get heavy enough to fuse the carbon in its core and even heavier elements. Instead of just double shell burning, it can sustain multiple shell fusion. The nuclear reactions in a high-mass star's final stages of life can become quite complex, and many different reactions can take place at the same time. The simplest of these occur through successive helium capture reactions. These are reactions in which a helium nucleus fuses with some other nucleus. Helium capture reactions can change carbon and into oxygen and oxygen into neon and neon into magnesium and so on. At high enough temperatures, even more interesting reactions can take place. 
Some of these heavy element reactions release neutrons, which may fuse with other heavy nuclei to make still rarer elements. The star is forging the variety of elements that were necessary for life on Earth. Each time the core runs out of the element it's fusing, it shrinks and heats up until it becomes hot enough for another fusion reaction. Meanwhile, another type of shell fusion ignites between the core and the overlying shells. Near the end of its life, the star's central region resembles the inside of an everlasting gobstopper with layer upon layer of shells burning different elements. During the star's final few days, it's fusing silicon into iron, and the iron begins to fill up in the core. Iron is unique among the elements because it's one element from which it is not possible to generate any kind of nuclear energy. We've so far been getting energy in the star from fusing together lighter elements. For example, fusing hydrogen into helium generates energy because helium has a lower mass per nuclear particle than hydrogen. The extra mass is released as energy. Carbon also has a lower mass per nuclear particle than helium, which means some of the mass disappears and becomes ener energy when it fuses. This is a plot of the mass per nuclear particle versus atomic mass. The low mass elements have a larger mass per nuclear particle. This means when we fuse them together, mass is released as energy. The mass per nuclear particle decreases as we go from light elements to iron. Beyond iron, the mass per nuclear particle increases. As a result, elements heavier than iron cannot generate nuclear energy by fusion. They can generate energy through fission by breaking apart, but not through fusion. Iron has the lowest mass per nuclear particle of all nuclei and therefore cannot release energy either by fusion or fission. Once the stellar core is full of iron, it won't be able to fuse, and it's the end of the line for the massive star. If the high-mass star can't fuse iron, then what happens to it? For a brief time, degeneracy pressure will support the inert iron core. Soon, though, gravity will push the electrons past their quantum mechanical limit. Conditions are so extreme that in an instant, the electrons combine with protons to form neutrons, releasing neutrinos in the process. In a fraction of a second, an iron core with the mass comparable to that of our sun and a size larger than that of Earth collapses into a ball of neutrons just a few kilometers across. The collapse stops only because neutrons have a degeneracy pressure of their own. The entire core is basically a giant atomic nucleus in space called a neutron star. The gravitational collapse of the core releases an enormous amount of energy, driving the outer layers of the star into space in an enormous explosion called a supernova. In some cases, the remaining mass of the core may be so large that nothing can stop its collapse and it becomes a black hole. For about a week, a supernova will shine as brightly as 10 billion suns. The ejected gases slowly cool and fade in brightness over the next several months, continuing to expand outward until they eventually mix with other gases in interstellar space. The remains of many supernova explosions can still be seen as supernova remnants. The most famous example is the Crab Nebula in the constellation of Taurus. At least four supernovae have been observed during the past 1,000 years in the Milky Way galaxy. No supernova has been seen in our own galaxy since 1604, but supernovae are often discovered in other galaxies. The nearest of these extragalactic supernovae came into view in 1987. Supernova 1987A was the explosion of a star in the Large Magellanic Cloud, a small ga galaxy that orbits the Milky Way. The scattered debris of a supernova carries with it all the elements produced in the star's core, as well as additional elements created during the supernova explosion. 
Millions or billion years later, these elements may be incorporated into a new generation of stars. The astronomer Carl Sagan often said, we are star stuff. It's true, all of us, our planet, our solar system, all were created from the debris of stars that exploded long ago. I'll leave you with that thought. Take care, and I'll talk to you soon.